Good morning, everyone. This is Kristen Roadman, Director of Talent Programs for the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. To those of you who joined us on Wednesday, we thank you for your patience as we work through our technical difficulties. We're excited to revisit the first in our new weekly webinar series with our training partner, Illinois Biz. In planning our first training webinar, learning about strategies to build resilience seemed fitting. We've all been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in some form, and the resilience of our companies and organizations is being tested like never before. For those of you who are joining via Zoom, you can submit a question in writing at any point during the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We have time at the end and we'll get to as many questions as possible. We will also be recording this and every webinar in this series, and those will be available for streaming online at our website, chicagolandchamber.org. Now let's get started. It's my pleasure to turn things over to Francine Pillman, Senior Consultant with Illinois Biz, who will lead us through the discussion, including providing us with strategies on overcoming adversity and challenging times. Francine? Thank you, Kristen. Good morning. In times like these, living and thriving during a pandemic, I am happy to talk about building resilience. We will discuss the research around resilience, the five building blocks of learning resilience, how organizations can respond to setbacks in six strategies for overcoming adversity. Next slide, please. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the 1960s and 1970s. My generation is called the lost generation. As I graduated from high school and college with a degree in chemical engineering, the steel mills were collapsing. The local economy was destroyed. Most people had to leave Pittsburgh for career advancement. I transferred to Chicago to work and pursue a graduate degree at Northwestern University. The population in Pittsburgh has decreased 50%, yes, five zero since the 1960s when I was born. My family has been in Pittsburgh since the 1930s. I still have family and friends in Pittsburgh. Every time I have attended a class reunion, it has been surprising to learn about some of the developments in the lives of my classmates. Some have become presidents of organizations while others have died from deaths of despair. I have often wondered why do some people thrive in life while others cannot bounce back from setbacks. I'm unsure why this happens. I was. I'm sure some of you have had similar thoughts when you think about your social networks. I have wondered why are some people resilient? Why are some people not resilient? Are we born with resilience or can resilience be taught? Today, we're going to explore these questions at a deeper level for individuals and organizations. Next slide, please. Researchers have studied resilience for more than 30 years. Dr. Silikman at the University of Pennsylvania is the father of the positive psychology movement he has written several books on the science of well being. The first book was Authentic Happiness. 10 years later, he wrote Flourish and most recently, The Hope Circuit. Dr. Silikman partnered with the United States Army to develop the comprehensive soldier fitness program for the well being of soldiers. Over 30,000 drill sergeants have been taught the science of well being. They have taught over 1 million soldiers and their families the science of well-being. Yale's most popular class is the science of well-being. Yes, resilience can be taught. It is being taught and learned every day. Next slide, please. A study was conducted to see how many people reacted to adversity, how they did it. People were randomly divided into three groups. The first group was exposed to a loud noise. They could stop the noise by pushing a button that was right in front of them. Those in the second group heard the same noise. When they pushed the button, it did not turn off the noise. The third group, the control group, did not hear a noise. The next day, the participants were put in a new situation ar around noise. To turn off the noise, all they had to do was move their hand 12 inches. The people in the first and third groups figured this out and stopped the noise. They pushed the button. But those in the second group typically did nothing. Nothing at all. In the first phase, they failed to turn off the noise. They realized they had no control. In phase two, expecting more failure, 
Many did not even try to turn off the noise. It turns out our minds are good about creating scenarios for the future. We deduce the future from past events. However, about a third of those in the second group did not become helpless. More research was done to determine why. Next slide, please. Optimism was the key ingredient. The people that did not become helpless during a setback were optimistic. They chose better beliefs about the situation. They activated their can-do spirit. They believed that the failure was a one-time local event. They brainstormed things that they could do to change their circumstances. They looked at the worst case and best case scenarios. They believed they could and would do something to change things. They were optimistic and persistent. They engaged in positive thinking. Next slide, please. Adversity and failure are a normal part of life. Dr. Silikman's research showed that how we react to adversity fell on a bell-shaped curve. The fall apart people went from sadness to depression. They personalized their failure. Their negative thoughts generated more negative thoughts. They fell into a cycle of despair. They became helpless and said, whoa, it's me. They did not believe they could do anything about their situation. They suffered from a form of post-traumatic stress. The people in the middle got sad and anxious about the future. They moved themselves beyond their negative thoughts. They eventually worked their way back to where they were before the setback. This is resilience. This is where most people fall. The extremely resilient people became better off than they were before. Yes, they too have depressive thoughts. However, they activated their optimism. They asked, what can I learn from this setback? What is this setback here to teach me? How can I use this setback for the greater good? They use adversity as a springboard. They had experienced post-traumatic growth. Three Nobel Peace Prize winners are prime examples of post-traumatic growth. Elie Wiesel survived the Holocaust to write books and fight for human rights. Nelson Mandela served 27 years in prison and went on to become the first black president of South Africa. Malala survived getting shot by the Taliban for going to school and is now an advocate for educating girls. That's what post-traumatic growth looks like. My hometown Pittsburgh has experienced post-traumatic growth. In 2010, Forbes magazine named it America's most livable city. It's a regional hub for hospitals, universities, and tech companies. Resilient cities, resilient people. Next slide, please. Resilient people have mantras. Nietzsche was a philosopher in the 1800s. He believed that knowledge was conditional and contingent relative to various changing perspectives. We inherently know this and practice this. How many times have you said, let me sleep on it, and in the morning, I'll make a decision. We know that our perspective will probably change. We may see things differently in the morning. Nietzsche suffered from mental illness. At the age of 72, he had a mental breakdown and was forced to resign from his professorship. Nietzsche believed in self-overcoming. He believed that we had to fight for what we want to become. He believed that we had to rise above whatever life throws at us. Nietzsche created the mantra that many people still use today. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. That's post-traumatic growth. Next slide, please. Another popular mantra is, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. That was created by Vivian Green. Let me tell you Vivian's story. She worked in advertising. After a few weeks on her job at an advertising agency, she was sexually assaulted by a senior partner. She responded by throwing coffee on him and she was fired. This was before the age of Me Too. Vivian was given severance pay. Vivian was, was really good at writing copy. The agency asked her to continue to write copy for them as a freelancer. That led to her creating cards, which turned into the Kisses comic strip, books, and licensing deals. Vivian loved to dance and came up with the mantra, 
Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. Vivian Green used adversity as a springboard. She had post-traumatic growth. We can all learn to become resilient. Next slide, please. We need to learn how to stop the downward spiral that often follows failure. Resilience and post-traumatic growth can be learned. Silikman developed the PERMA model for learning how to become resilient. P is for positive emotion. We must have a steady stream of positive emotions. We should practice smiling often. Smiling lifts our emotions. When you look at yourself in the mirror, please smile, make it a habit. On a daily basis, make sure you do the things that make you happy. We need to amplify our positive emotions to help us overcome negative emotions. We need to stop the downward spiral. We need negative emotions when they arise, acknowledge them and feel them. Then activate your positive emotions, substitute your negative emotions with positive emotions. Positivity is a habit. E is for engagement. We must engage in our lives. We need to show up. We need to do things that really matter to us and are aligned with our core values. We should do the things that we are good at and passionate about, those things that we lose ourselves in. When we do them, we enter a state of flow where we don't recognize the time has passed. R is for relationships. We need healthy relationships to thrive. We must communicate and spend time with people that really matter. We need to be fully present. We must be emotionally available and connected to our family, friends, and coworkers in a positive way. We must have active and constructive conversations, celebrate their wins. We need to allow them to relive their wins by telling us how they accomplished the win and how it felt. Winning feels good. We need to validate their stories and talents, focus on their strengths, focus on the positive. This is an excellent recipe for one-on-one -on -one check ins with our employees. M is for meaning. Meaning in our lives is important. We must have a deep sense of purpose in our lives and align with that often. Otherwise, if we are untethered, we can be caught in a cycle of despair. We must belong to and serve something larger than ourselves. Today, many employees join organizations because of the mission and value of the organization. This is a key driver of employee engagement. According to Gallup, only 35% of employees were engaged at work in 2019. Leaders must and need to help employees connect with the mission of the organization. Every employee must understand the purpose of their work and how it aligns to the mission of the organization. A is for accomplishment. We must stretch ourselves with goals that challenge us. We also need experiences that fire us up. We need to experience the joy of achievement. Companies should help employees find their strengths, amplify their strengths to help the organization win. This is also a driver of employee engagement in organizations. One of the PERMA elements does not define well being, but each one contributes to our well being. Resilient leaders make organizations great. Leaders are responsible for the culture. Barbara Fredrickson and her colleague Marcel Lazada studied the transcript from meetings in 60 companies. They found that companies with a ratio of at least 2.9 words, positive words spoken for every one negative word spoken, flourish. On the other hand, companies where more negative words were spoken than positive words were spoken did poorly. No business can do well without a great culture. Culture trumps strategy every day. In your organization, start every conversation and every meeting with positive words. Next slide, please. As we are dealing with the corona crisis, resilient leaders have to step up and lead their organization to post-traumatic growth. Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. We are in crisis mode. According to McKinsey, organizations can experience post-traumatic growth because of three things, strong leadership, the ability to adapt, and innovation. 
the leadership teams and organizations must unify and confront their current situation. The coronavirus is here. It is impacting their business, employees, and customers. Employees are afraid. The leadership teams are responsible for reframing the situation, for creating a better reality for the organization. They need to shine the light on a better future. The leaders must act with a sense of urgency and decisively. The response cannot be delayed. It is their job to do something now. They cannot wallow in despair. Leaders must over-communicate with employees, customers, business partners, and other key stakeholders. They must provide a clear and honest assessment of the situation and develop a clear plan. I'm sure you have received notes from airlines, restaurants, suppliers, and customers during this coronavirus pandemic. My spring break in Europe was canceled. The hotel called me to say that they had canceled my reservation because of the coronavirus pandemic and that they hope to see me in the future. The response must be aligned with the core values of the organization. People must be at the core. During the coronavirus, many organizations are responding with a core value that people are first. They are taking care of employees so that employees can take care of the customers. The leadership team should do a SWOT analysis, which stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. They must look at the internal strengths of the organization and the weaknesses of the business. Also, the external opportunities and threats. Once the SWOT analysis has been completed, the leadership team must develop strategies and action plans for how they are going to respond and thrive. The leadership team must determine how they plan to use innovation to change their business model and product offerings as necessary. How they plan to pivot and create a stronger business. Never waste a good crisis. We have seen many organizations practice this with their response to the coronavirus. Many restaurants and businesses have offered special pay and bonuses to employees. They have geared up for pickup and delivery services. Stores have created shopping hours for seniors. Working together, we can and will survive the coronavirus pandemic. For over 30 years, Illinois Biz has worked with organizations to solve tough problems. Before the current crisis, our clients had identified their top three business problems as finding skilled workers, building their leadership pipeline, and improving their value proposition. Biz has worked with our clients to develop customized solutions for system-wide improvements. The solutions included designing and implementing apprenticeship programs, leadership development programs, and lean transformations. Our motto is learn by doing. Resilient people create resilient organizations. Next slide, please. There are six strategies that each of us can do to overcome adversity. The first is we can find our strengths and practice them often. For a week before you go to bed, write down what went well today and why they went well. A second thing that we can do is identify and repeat mantras. My mantra is this too shall pass. Or you can use what doesn't kill me makes me stronger or make up your own. A third thing that you could do is keep a gratitude journal. Every day, write down three things for which you are grateful for. There are also apps you can download for keeping a gratitude journal. A fourth thing that you can do is turn on your favorite music and get lost in singing. Better yet, join your neighborhood sing-along or start one. During the coronavirus crisis, we have seen Italy and Chicago break out in song. A fifth thing that you can do is dance. My absolute favorite song is Happy by Pharrell. I cannot listen to this song without getting happy, singing, and dancing. The next time it rains, literally take Vivian Green's advice and dance in the rain. It's so much fun. Another thing and sixth thing that you could do is if you have a setback, give yourself permission to nurse your wounds, also establish a date to start brainstorming, and identify a date when you will take your first action to achieve post-traumatic growth. Keep getting up. Next slide, please. 
In conclusion, we have talked about the five building blocks for learning resilience, how companies can respond to setbacks, and six strategies we can practice to overcome adversity. Now I would like to answer a few questions. Great, thank you, Francine. We have a few questions. Um, so I will start with the first one. Can you talk more about how companies and organizations can adapt to these strategies given the current situation with all of us sequestered in our homes, feeling more isolated than ever? When employees feel more isolated than ever, I think it is really imperative for organizations to perhaps use things like Zoom, like we're using today. We need to make sure that we're connecting and that we're talking to employees and you can hold meetings where you can see people and have conversations and develop, do your SWOT analysis, check in with employees. But I'm a big proponent of using the technology that we have today where if we're isolated, we can actually see people. Uh, personally, my mother, I, we're doing that with work in my company. And then on the personal side, my mother is 81 years old in Pittsburgh. And believe me, to teach an 81 year old how to use video chatting has been difficult, but we have done that so that I can make sure that she is okay too and that she isn't isolated because I have finally driven into her head that she cannot go outside of her home. I'm going through the same thing with my mom as well. <laughs> um, how does this apply to large organizations where individual leaders and department heads may set up their own mini cultures? And what happens when you have um, a potpourri of different cultures and different styles of leadership within a single organization? So for, for large organizations, and I have experienced this firsthand as I worked for 25 years in organizations before joining Illinois Biz, and with some of our clients today. I think it's imperative for the senior leadership team to really decide what is our culture going to be and making sure that we are holding people accountable for changing those subcultures if they need to be changed because we need to have that alignment. If there is not that alignment and we have these subcultures, then that is where sometimes um, we start to see where employees have cynicism because they say management says one thing, leadership says one thing, and then they do another. So the employee experience is different. The senior leadership team has to hold themselves accountable for having one culture. And some of the things that we do with our clients is we do an employee survey uh, to help give feedback and then develop action plans for making sure that we have that alignment. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we have a question, another question here. Um, so some organizations are finding that employees are more efficient working from home, spending a full eight to nine hours. How, oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, we're finding that employees are more efficient working from home. However, spending a full eight to nine hours working from home is really exhausting. Um, this organization is considering a work day from home that might be less than the actual hours worked in the office. Do you have an opinion on this? So I, I do have an opinion on that. When you look at the research for how long work days are, um, some of the research that has come out recently is that when employees work fewer hours, they are actually more productive. And so my personal opinion is that when we come out of this coronavirus crisis, I think uh, companies are going to fully, a lot of companies, more companies are going to embrace the well-being of employees and then looking at what does that work-life balance look like, uh, what that should be, and, and if we can, give employees more flexibility. Great, thanks. Um, so a few more here. Um, can you give some examples uh, without naming names of how certain companies you've worked with have successfully implemented um, these various strategies you've described today? And then what are some of the most common setbacks you've seen as well? Okay, so how some have, some of our companies that we've worked with have implemented the strategies. There are some success stories on our website, illinoisbiz.org that will name companies. But with the leadership development programs, what I can tell you what's been most successful as the company has developed their strategy, understanding the core strengths that they need in people, we have partnered with them to develop a curriculum and 
making sure that we have employees do projects and have mentors in the organization so that we can, we can move the leaders through the pipeline. And a lot of times what we end up for companies that I have worked with for over five to seven years, we have used that leadership pipeline um, to change the organization's culture. Because when you, when you have high performing employees with high capability, they see things where people that are 20 years into their career, there may be some generational differences and companies have to get good at adapting their culture to the generations that are coming behind them. So those programs are really successful when one, the, the, the program is customized to the organization, two, when the employees that are going through the program where they can have mentors in that organization, and three, when they can have, when they do projects that they have identified some things in the organization that need to change and the things that they learn because Illinois Biz, we say we learn by doing where they can actually have a project, some projects that are supported by the senior leadership team to help them move the culture and practice things. Great, thank you. And we have a follow up to an earlier question. Okay. Um, so what if you don't have consensus on a resilience strategy among your senior leadership? You know, we've all worked in organizations that were perhaps less than functional. So what can mid level managers do to be resilient in the absence of organizational guidance? So what, what I work really hard with, with senior leaders and also middle managers, I work with a, a lot of middle management, and one of the first things that I do is when I'm going to work with an organization, I want to work with the senior leadership team as well. And one of the commitments that I have to get them to make is that for their high potential employees and employees that they want to develop, that their perception is the reality of the organization. So they have to, if issues come up, they want to ask them, what issues do you think are going to come up? And two, I need your commitment that when the issue comes up, that you will, as a leadership team, that you will address those and that you have to come in and make that commitment. And what I do is I create a parking lot when I'm working with middle management as we're going through our programs. And I have, I, I do not write in the parking lot. I have them write down, reach consensus on how they want to frame their question to senior leadership and say, here is an issue or a problem or a challenge. And because they are leaders, that they have the requirement to say, here is what our recommendation is for the organization. Here's what we would like to see change. Here's our proposed solution. And we would like to partner with you to talk about that. If senior leaders won't listen, then hopefully there is some way that an employee survey can be done. And if we can bring those issues up in our one-on-ones, because we should be having one-on-ones with our employees, if we can bring those up one on one with our leaders to help get things to change. Does that answer the follow up question? That's a great question. Yes, great answer. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we have another question. Do you think that some of the resilience strategies work better than the others in teams with many different cultural backgrounds? I, I, I think uh, that, uh, that that is probably true when you start to look at some of the different cultural backgrounds. Absolutely. Okay, and let's see, you mentioned SWOT analysis. What's the best way to actually conduct one as a team, um, have a leadership team, or get all staff feedback? So I, it, 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 the senior leadership team uh, are gonna be the drivers of that. And with senior leadership teams, one of the things they have to have a great deal of is humility. And so if the senior leadership team is going to come to do a SWOT analysis, then every senior leader should have worked with their teams to understand how they see things in the organizations because the thinking needs to go deep. Uh, sometimes when we're in senior leadership positions, we believe that we know things to be true, but when we go to the front lines or when we work with middle management, they will tell us how things really are. So it so it it we we do have to get people 
um, throughout the organization involved in that. And, and senior leaders, before the meeting, they should have gathered some information from their teams, and then they can put that together, coalesce the information as a group. Great, thanks. And I do wanna remind all attendees to please feel free to add questions to the webinar chat area and we'll make sure those get asked. Um, and we're just gonna do two more questions. So one um, is, do you have recommendations for how we can help coworkers that you know may be more extroverted and used to being with people more and now are you know, in their homes? Yes, I, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the group chatting. There uh, is a lot of software out there. You can use your smartphones, but I would just recommend is maybe at least one or two times a day, just have a five to 10 minute check-in with that person uh, where we can see them or we can, and, and also throughout the day, if we need to, we can use the group chatting, but we should not just because we're isolated in our homes, we need to reach out to people more, uh, continue those connections with, our, with the relationships with our coworkers. So uh, group chatting through your email system, other software that's available to you, and video chatting using our phones or using software that you have. But, but I would recommend scheduling time, at least scheduling time. Great, okay, and then um, our last question, do you have any words of advice for leaders whose um, senior leadership may not be as sensitive during this time period or communicative? So what I would recommend is that we can always reach out to the most senior leader that we know and just engage with them in conversation and to say, here are some of the things that I was thinking about. When I have worked with senior leaders in organizations, and a lot of times where some are going through a crisis, what most of them have told me when they're not communicating, they have said, Francine, I don't know what to say. I don't know what the future looks like. And I tell them, we are all human. We're gonna be in situations like that. And the most honest thing you can say to them is, let's work together and we're going to figure this out. But if you're silent, then people will fill in the message and they will interpret that silence in the way that they want. So that's when senior leadership loses control of the message and then they also lose the heart of people. And people are what make organizations great. So sometimes we have to help senior leaders do better. They're, they're human as well, and we're never, none of us will always get it right all the time. Great. And Francine, do you have a final recommendation for what everyone on the line, um, you know, one idea that they could take back to their teams? One idea to take back to your teams is please, with your teams, in this time of the coronavirus pandemic, just establish a time, if it's not once a day, once every other day or once a week, but establish some group time where you guys can just talk and check in to make sure that everybody is okay and open it up for the things that they want to talk about. Because in this time is when we really have to find our humanity. We're all in this together. Great. Francine, thank you so much. I'd like to take this, you know, really thank you for taking the time to lead us through this important discussion on resilience. Um, for the audience, if you like this webinar, join us next Wednesday, April 1st at 10 a.m., and we'll be focusing on stress management. We'll also announce more trainings in the coming weeks um, with our partner, Illinois Biz. <clears throat> I'll end by saying that during this unprecedented crisis, the Chicagoland Chamber remains committed to providing our members in the business community with the advocacy, tools, and trainings needed to help your organization compete and recover. If you aren't a member yet, there are many benefits available to your company and all of your employees when you join the Chamber. One of those benefits is 50% off customized training from our partner, Illinois Biz, through our employee training program, which is funded through the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Please contact me at kroadman at chicagolandchamber.org for more information about this program. Uh, finally, the Chamber will continue to bring you up-to-date guidance about COVID-19, including the impact to the business community and financial relief and resources that are available for your organization. 
And in fact, today we have a webinar at 1 p.m. with the direct um, with Director Aaron Guthrie of DCEO, the State of Illinois. So please visit our website at chicagolandchamber.org for more information about this webinar and more upcoming webinars uh, and programming. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate it.